In the West, we encounter a good number of people who've heard something about Jesus, but who have rejected him in some way. Gospel work in South Asia is very different. Tim helps us understand what it's like to be around people who have never heard anything about the God of the Bible. Our workers encounter people who have never rejected Jesus. They have never said no to him. They've never refused our request to pray for them. They simply have never heard the name of Jesus. And if they have heard that name, they have a very flawed understanding of who, of who Jesus is. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples that the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help right now on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. Welcome again to the Voice of the Martyrs Radio. My name is Todd Nettleton. We are in the studio today in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, uh, with two more of our one name only guests. If you've listened for a long time, you know we often have people working in hostile and restricted nations. We don't want to compromise their security, so we just use one name. This week we have Tim and Don. They are serving in South Asia and have been for a number of years. Tim and Don, welcome to Voice of the Martyrs Radio. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Todd. You guys started out in pastoral ministry here in the U.S., and at some point God picked you up and transplanted you to South Asia. Talk to me about that process. How did you sense that calling? Was that something you had always sensed and you knew that was the goal, or did he kind of change your path? Just give me a little bit of background on how you ended up serving in South Asia. Yeah. I think I'll let Dawn start. We normally let her share a little bit about we are from two very different backgrounds, yeah. but why don't you share just a minute on that? Sure. So I'm a pastor's daughter and was um, I felt the call to missions when I was a little girl. And so from a young age, I, I felt that's what Jesus was asking for me. So I went to Bible college and with the goal of being a missionary my whole life. So for me, it's just kind of getting to live my dream and, and what I wanted to be like some girls want to be a ballerina. I just wanted to be a missionary. That's... So I got to know you're at Bible college and some guy comes along and wants to ask you out on a date. Is yes. your first question now, are you cool to be a missionary or? Honestly, I only dated missions majors. That All was right. it. Yeah. So that was part of the deal. That okay. Of the yeah. Deal. So Don and I met in the, you know, in a missions class at Central Bible College up the road here in Springfield, Missouri. And I came from a home where there was divorce and all kinds of difficulties and challenges. My uh, football coach invited me to church. I wow. came to faith uh, in, a, in a small uh, church in Ashland, Ohio, and went on a discipleship journey, went on my first ever missions trip to Granada, Spain when I was in that church. And only then did I feel like God might be calling me to serve in missions. And so I always say as well that our call was a little bit Abrahamic. And when God told Abraham, go into the land that I will show you, so Don's background is that she had been to like Siberia. I had been to Spain and we thought, well, maybe we'll meet somewhere in the middle. Uh, it'll be, you know, somewhere in Eastern Europe or we'll end up, you know, some different place. But uh, really what happened is as we set out in pastoral ministry, God just broke our heart for South Asia and especially Sri Lanka. And so that's where we ended up. We always prayed uh, that if God wanted to shift us and move us, we'd be willing to do that. And we believe God's much more concerned about our obedience than he is our comfort. And, and that's where he called us to go and serve. And we have been there 11 years now and thrilled to be there. How hard was that transition from life in America to life in Sri Lanka? Yeah. It was hard, but I think some of the hardest challenges were to give up the identity of America of I have my rights. I have a voice. I'm a woman, but that doesn't make me second class. Whereas in a lot of our countries of Southern Asia, my voice is very much not valued there. And so to even have to learn to tame myself and not take it as this isn't who God called me to be, but more of in order to be an effective witness, let me also embrace the culture that I'm now living in. And it's okay to repress and to to choose not to speak sometimes. 
I've become all things to all men yeah. that by all means I might win some of them. I hear a little bit of that in, in that story. Yeah. Yeah, Todd, I remember we had not been in the country very long and just a little overwhelmed with the with the complete switch. So yeah. we had been senior pastors. We were leading a congregation that we loved, that we knew. We had an annual budget that was sizable and generous and, you know, income and all of those things. And then suddenly you find yourself in a country where you can't even ask where the bathroom is in the local language and people just look at you. Yeah. So that was a huge adjustment. And then, of course, we had a teenage daughter and a preteen son. So that was definitely a consideration. But yeah. it was amazing how throughout that process, it just seemed that God did call the entire family to go and to serve. Our kids are 26 and 25 now. And they continually just express to us what a wonderful experience it was for them. Mm -hmm. They would not trade it for anything. And, of course, they've been back to visit a few mm -hmm. times as well because, you know, Sri Lanka has become like a, a secondary home to them as well. It's also incredibly beautiful. It, Everyone it, should visit. It is beautiful. That's true. It's, they should. We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Tim and Dawn. They are serving in South Asia I want to talk a little bit about some of the countries, and I want to paint a picture for our listeners of the the level of lostness. So you guys are overseeing work in Bangladesh, Bhutan, Maldives, Nepal, Sri Lanka. Of those, the, the most reached is Nepal and Sri Lanka, 1.4% Christian, 98.5% not Christian. Uh, you talk about the Maldives, 0.03%, not even a tenth of a percent, paint a picture for us of people living their entire lives and dying without ever meeting anyone who's heard the name of Jesus. I, I mean, just I, I think for us, it's kind of mind-blowing. Every day, uh, our workers in those five countries encounter people who have never rejected Jesus. They have never said no to him. They've never refused our request to pray for them. They simply have never heard the name of Jesus. And if they have heard that name, they have a very flawed understanding of who, of who Jesus is. So it, it is. It is a complete shift. And, you know, we, even in our, for our own personal adjustment in those countries that you just listed off, in two of those countries, there's nothing at all that resembles church like you and I might know it. And so... It is very simple, basic, house church, uh, small groups, some of them meet in secret. Even in the uh, countries where we do have an established church, there's a lot of that going on. And there's just this great misunderstanding about who Jesus is. I, I think of the parable uh, of the talents just real quickly, where you'll remember that last servant, he buried his talent in the ground, and he makes this statement. Then when the master comes back and says, why did you not at least put it in the bank so that it could have gained interest or something like that? The, the servant responds, he says, well, I knew you to be a very hard man. And when you really look at that statement, it's the story of so many Southern Asians. Uh, what the servant was saying is that he had heard a rumor that the master was difficult, that the master was hard to get along with. Well, so many in our countries, they've heard a rumor or a story about who Jesus is or what he has done. And he usually, Jesus is usually cast in some kind of hostile light, and they've not had an encounter with the real Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's vitally important that we live in community with the lost people we're trying to reach, and we, we paint that we picture like of Jesus. Jesus. That's right. Our neighbors, when we first moved in, they were they were just very vital and inter instrumental in us getting adapted and, and set. But they were totally Buddhist. And so it was us just relying on them for like where to shop and stuff. And so they considered us family. And so she told me that she was inviting me over because the fortune teller was coming to tell the fortunes of the whole family. They've paid for it. It's very expensive, but we're family. So you can come over and be yes, part of this. We'll and get so, your fortune told too. Exactly. And so I, I remember in my mind thinking, oh my goodness, don't let it show on my face, how shocked I am by this, you know, <laughs> development. So I said, oh, you know, we follow Jesus. And so 
um, a part of that is that we trust our future to him. And so whatever he wants for us, that's what we do. But she didn't know to hide her face because her face showed the shock of what I was thinking from her question to me was, oh, my goodness, do you actually believe that? That's what she said to me. And I was like, I totally believe that. And so while I appreciate our friendship, I'm going to decline the offer, but I will come over and have dinner with you. So, yeah, I, I think that it's that kind of um, environment of how even in America, when there's so many non-Christians, I, I understand that. But the Jesus is very much part of our cultural upbringing mm-hmm. in church and even uh, gospel stories, like they know there's so many parables that are just known. You can say something about David and Goliath and people kind of have a reference point, even though they yep. couldn't tell the whole story in Sri Lanka and in many parts of Asia. Those stories are just not even part of the culture. It's like David and who? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Within that context, how is the gospel spreading? I mean, you mentioned being in community. People know you. People know a Christian. Mm-hmm. How is the gospel spreading in those places? So I'll, I'll tell you, Todd, I just believe that people can be discipled before they follow Jesus. And I think that most of the teams on the ground in our countries have that same understanding. And what we mean by that is that we just seize every single opportunity to find a way to thread the gospel into that. So... If we, if we have a neighbor, a husband and wife that are having challenges and they're arguing and there's a disagreement and so there's likely an opportunity for Don or myself to have a conversation with one of those spouses, the idea is that we would share how God might view this challenge and this difficulty and then help them navigate through it. The same with personal finances and budgeting and all of those things we just make apart, you know, it's always in light of what does God say about this? Yeah. And most of our teams— And is that how you would say it to them? What, what does God say or what does the Bible say? Or do you kind of tell the story without saying the source of the story or, or a little bit of both? You know, it would just depend. Okay. I, I think because of our context, we do have to be careful. And we say— all of the time that we, we want to be under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. So what is the appropriate thing to say right now? And so, yeah, we, we would do a bit of both. Another thing that our teams do, though, that I think is so helpful is we use a method of sharing called gospel storying. And so whether we do that one-to-one or we might do that in a small group currently, our team that is on the ground, we, we do that in a small group setting on Sunday afternoons in one of our team members' apartments, and we share a three-minute story from God's Word. We tell it orally, and then we have a series of about five questions that center around that presentation that we ask the five or six people who are there, and we have a conversation. And so I think it makes Jesus knowable. Mm -hmm. It makes him very relevant to what they're facing, what they're dealing with. And give me, give me an example of, of one of those stories. Like, like what's a story that you've recently used in that setting to, to tell this story? Yeah. So I think recently uh, in our group, one of the stories that was told was Moses coming off the top of the mountain and seeing that the Israelites had uh, fashioned this golden calf, and he breaks the tablets. And then there's this whole uh, discourse or conversation about the fact that they had become idol worshipers, and this was upsetting to God. So it was amazing because we've told that story to Buddhist people before, and one of the questions seems to always get around to, what is an idol? Yeah. Because we're not thinking in that context. Right. And so we have to back up and say, okay, now an idol is anything, any person, anything that we would put in front of God and value that as more important. And so they'll kind of get it, but it's something we have to continually uh, hit on. And probably one of the most profound cases of that was a young Uber driver that one of our team members had caught an Uber one day, invited him to come for a story time. And I'll just never forget on a Saturday evening, sitting in our home, telling that story. And almost as if just right in front of me, watching the lights start to come on. 
he had been a Buddhist his entire life, and and his name was Sanjaya. And finally, he looks at the end of the story. He had interrupted several times because he could not get beyond the idol idea. And then he finally looks at myself and a guy on our team, and he said, I don't know, but I think just maybe that when I'm going to the Buddhist temple, that there are people in that temple that are worshiping idols. And I said, really? And he said, I think so. And what you're telling me is that that completely displeases your God. And I'm going to have to think about this. And that's what we're trying to do. Yes. You know, we don't resolve every conflict right. or everything that they're thinking. We just many times let it sit because we know that the word of God is active mm-hmm. and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And what he wants to teach them may not even be through the words, the Western cultural viewpoint that I'm coming from. He may want to show them a totally different way. And so we just try to walk through that with them. I was actually thinking about that with regard to the golden calf. And when you're working among Hindus mm. who think cows are holy, Absolutely. it seems like they would be like, of course you'd make a golden calf because cows are holy. Right. Yes. <laughs> We're talking this week on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Tim and Don. They are gospel workers in South Asia. So you have these storytelling sessions. Someone like the Uber driver eventually comes to faith in Christ. What is that Uber driver or housewife or whatever? What are they likely to run into if they come to that point of publicly saying, okay, I'm not a Buddhist anymore. I'm not a Hindu anymore. I'm going to follow Jesus. It would depend upon the family. but I mean, And we've seen just a variety of responses. I feel like for that young man who was an Uber driver, he made big steps toward Jesus. And at the end of the day, sadly for him, I think the family pressure just would not allow him to move forward. And then this week, we had a young lady respond in a text message to one of our team members and just say, I don't even know how to explain this, but my faith in God is growing every day as a result of being in these story sessions. Amen. And I'm contemplating leaving Buddhism and becoming a Christian. That was on a Sunday. On on Monday, she had a conversation with her mother, sends another text and said, well, my mom is not as angry as I thought she might be. Wow. Right. So we're going to continue walking, walking with her through that. So it would depend. There is a strong nationalistic faction of Buddhism in Sri Lanka. Many who would say to be Sri Lankan is to, you know, is to be Buddhist or whichever way that goes. Yeah. That, and so... It would it would depend on the family, but yes. So I, I it's interesting because you've mentioned the family several. It sounds like if the family's okay with it, you're probably okay. Right. If your family's not okay with it, you're going to have all kinds of trouble. Regardless of who the government is or who what village you live in, it it starts right there at at the people in your house. Right. It, it's immediately right there in front of them, and you normally have a minimum of two generations, but often three generations living in a house. Oh, wow. So you have grandparents, you have parents, and then you have, you know, the children. So those grandparents can be quite influential as well. They certainly feel like they are losing, in the case of Sri Lanka, they're losing that very strong Buddhist Mm -hmm. grip. Mm -hmm. And, and in some ways, they're being betrayed by this yes. this grandson or granddaughter or whatever. You're you're yeah. betraying our family by doing this, right? right. Because for years they've already been doing the rituals that honor their dead relatives. That's going to keep the merit and the karma going through the family, and so one generation can break it. Yeah, and we we have even had older Buddhist people say to us, "What's going to happen if our children will not continue doing the alms giving?" And to be, you know, just very honest, that has been some of the challenging conversations I know that Don and I have had to have with people because they suddenly realize, and they have been so blunt as to say to me before, you know, uh, if I follow Jesus, I am then in essence saying, Buddha is wrong. I will no longer do almsgiving, which is to earn merit for my dead relatives. 
And then ultimately, as they really get along in their discipleship, they have to somehow reconcile the fact that their loved one is lost for eternity. And that is a real challenge and hurdle for so many of them to get over, and it is heartbreaking. You are working in areas of the world where you're encountering Buddhists, you're encountering Hindus, you're encountering Muslims, sort of all three of those really major world religions. Talk about the differences in ministry. is, Is the storytelling approach... Does that work everywhere? Is there one that it works better among, say, Buddhists or Muslims? Talk a little bit about the differences in ministry in those different contexts. I think we're finding storytelling to be very effective in each of our five places, just because there are so many oral learners. Even if you're not an oral learner, though, I think all of us can relate. If you're giving me the choice to sit down and read a book to show me you know, how to change the oil in my car versus watching a YouTube video (laughs) or just hearing someone tell me this is how you can do it. I mean, you're always going to go for that that oral type of lesson. So I I feel like it's good. We're also continually finding that there are oral traditions in each of those major uh, religions as well. So, you know, they'll cite the Bhagavad Gita or the Quran or, you know, whatever else. And so, it seems like it's a natural way to be able to share information and have a conversation. I would say, though, that we do choose our stories based on the group of people that we're most trying to focus on for that story set. So for Buddhists, for example, we do not bring into um, any of our story arcs the sacrifices of animals. That would be so just appalling to them that you don't take a life. And so Yes, eventually we have to cross that bridge. But right. a, a, at first, as you're just trying to introduce them to what is the heart of God and how he wants to reconcile mankind, that we don't focus on a animal sacrifice. However, with Buddhists, we also don't want to talk about um, the heaven being forever because for them, they're trying to get out of the loop of reincarnation. So something being eternal also feels like a very big negative. It feels like a curse. Yes. <laughs> and so I, I know that also we do the same thing with Islam. We look at what do we have in common? Where can we find common stories? So if we know that we're going to have a certain group of people that are the majority of that story set, that we're going to change and pick stories and craft them in a way that Without changing the word of God, exactly, it just speaks into their worldview. Dawn and Tim have been telling us what it's like to share the truth of God's word in South Asia. I think we could all learn from some of the approaches that Dawn and Tim use to share Jesus with their neighbors. They engage in hospitality. They tell stories from the Bible. They live out the power of the gospel in their own lives. You may not live in South Asia, but wherever you live, you can do the same things they are doing. And so can I. One of our online listeners, Michael, told us that he's been encouraged to share his faith while listening to the Voice of the Martyrs radio. He listened to an episode where we interviewed a believer from Iran. And after that, he sent me a note and said, I want to and really need to be able to share the gospel to my friends and neighbors. I've been a Christian believer for over 40 years and hardly ever share my faith with anyone. This message from the Iranian woman was very inspiring and encourages me to get out and share Jesus. Thank you, Michael, for sending that note. Your note is an answer to our prayers because we pray that our listeners will be inspired to share the gospel, to share Christ with the people around them. If you're listening right now, I think you'll also be encouraged to build God's kingdom when you dive into the show archives on our website, vomradio.net. You may even want to go right now and listen to that Iranian woman who is sharing Christ and planting churches inside the Islamic Republic of Iran. And if you share this program with a Christian friend, you'll be encouraging them to share their faith as well. You can send them a link when you visit our website, vomradio.net. 
Next week, Tim and Don will be back with us. They'll continue telling us ways they engage with their community in Sri Lanka and in the surrounding nations. They will also share ways that we can pray for this strategic area of the world. I know you'll be encouraged by that. Please be back with us next week right here on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network.